harassment of the caretakers, one of whom told President Smith, we have the worstest young men and the mostest of them I ever see. One of the best windows on academic life from a student perspective perspective at Randolph Macon in Boyden is derived from a diary that Samuel Lander Jr., a member of the class of 1852, kept during the academic year 1850-51 when he was a junior. I am Samuel Lander Jr. I am 17 years old and a member of the junior class in the Franklin Literary Society at Randolph-Macon College near Boyton in Mecklenburg County, Virginia. I am rooming in number 60 on the fourth floor of the West Wing. My roommate is W.J. Green, a freshman from Wake County, North Carolina. The date is November 7, 1850, and on this date I began a daily diary. January 16. I rose this morning an hour before day and studied Latin grammar till the first bell and French grammar till prayers. After prayers by Professor Stewart, I stayed in Speed's room till breakfast, after which I came immediately into my room and wrote part of a letter to Pa. At 11, I went up to the laboratory and Professor Stewart gave us a lesson in chemistry to get tomorrow morning. After dinner, I finished my letter and went to Boyton, taking with me my pants, which were injured by the rats, in order to have them mended. Incidentally, dinner, as used in his diary, meant the midday meal. While there, I picked out a piece of goods at Duggar and Gary's tailor shop to have a pair of pants made. I came back to college in time for prayers, and after supper, I read 50 lines from Virgil, looked over my chemistry lesson, and went to bed. A later entry in his diary says that he paid Duggar and Gary's five dollars and a half for his new pair of pants. Brother Blackwell and several students came to college this evening. I gave Mallory five dollars as directed by Pa to pay for two copies of the Randolph-Macon magazine, and I also spent twelve and a half cents for a tin cup. The weather is very pleasant and clear. My health is good as usual. Highlight of the college academic year was graduation, which was always held over a two-day period in the middle of June, usually on a Wednesday and a Thursday. This account of the graduation of 1842 is taken from Richard Irby's History of Randolph-Macon. Uh, Mr. Irby, a longtime treasurer of the college and member of the Board of Trustees for decades afterwards, was a student at Randolph-Macon and graduated in Boyton. Uh, during the 1840s. According to Mr. Irby, visitors began to fill up the boarding houses around the college and the hotels on Tuesday. The Board of Trustees assembled on Tuesday at an early hour in closed session. Friends of the graduates from Virginia and the Carolinas were largely in attendance on Wednesday for the opening exercises in the chapel at 11 a.m. A band had been playing for hours previous on the campus and continued in the gallery of the chapel. The chaplain gave the invocation. The president introduced the alumni orator who addressed the alumni society and the audience. The annual oration before the literary societies was given by a famous evangelist of the time who was a renowned orator. He was the main show. The chapel was packed and the crowd outside was as large as inside. In the afternoon, the representatives of the Washington and Franklin Literary Societies delivered orations in the chapel. At night, the societies held their annual meetings at which the president's elect presided and made addresses along with the debates following, in which the honorary members were also expected to take part. The society medals and honors were delivered to graduate members. These meetings were held in the society's halls and not open to the public. At night, the parlors of private houses and the hotels were radiant with the wealth of beauty gathered from Virginia and North Carolina. The next day, the graduating class made their last bows to a college audience, having, according to custom, appeared three times before in the last year of their course. The Latin salutatory came first, delivered by the second honor man. This was followed by the orations of others without regard to grade. The closing valedictory was delivered by the first honor man, who in a manner represented the whole class. Then each graduate received their diploma, delivered by the president, who in Latin said, accept a hoc diploma, as he handed the diploma. 
The graduating class was complimented by a party given in their honor by the students at the stewards' hall, which was largely attended. This closed the commencement. So great was the interest in the annual commencement that parties came from long distances even as far as South Carolina. Some came in coaches drawn by four horses with outriders. Randolph Megan, a pioneer alma mater and her offspring. From the beginnings at Boyton and later maturation here, ultimately grew five institutions known as the Randolph-Macon System, Randolph-Macon College, Randolph-Macon Women's College, the two Randolph-Macon Academies in Bedford and Front Royal, and Randolph-Macon Institute in Danville. Moreover, over a dozen Methodist-related colleges in Virginia and North Carolina trace their spiritual antecedents to this place. However, in the last analysis, a college is an entity in which the generations are knit each to each. Randolph-Macon students and faculty who lived, shared, and bonded at Boyton included many notable persons. For example, the second president, Landon Garland, was later the longtime chancellor of Vanderbilt University in Nashville. His infant son is buried in the college cemetery here at Boyton. Another notable graduate was John Granberry, valedictorian of the class of 1848, well known as the fighting chaplain of the Confederacy and later a prominent Methodist bishop. Samuel Lander, whom we have already met, valedictorian of the class of 1852, was the founder of Lander College in Greenwood, South Carolina. Another prominent educator was Richard Watson Jones, class of 1857, and the founding president of Mississippi College for Women in Columbus, Mississippi. And two roommates, David Clopton and Robert Lanier of Georgia. Clopton, valedictorian of the class of 1840, represented the Montgomery, Alabama area in the United States and Confederate States Congresses, and thereafter for many years was an associate justice on the Supreme Court of Alabama. Robert Lanier of Macon, who along with Burwell Harrison married ladies they met while at Randolph-Macon, was the father of Sidney Lanier, the famed poet laureate of the South. College years and the associations formed during this time between youth and adulthood and the enabling institution are among the most cherished events in a person's life. And no place is more special than the birthplace in Boyton of America's oldest continuous Methodist college. Several persons have asked, why are we trying to preserve the main building in Boyton, and what are the plans for doing so? One of the first questions asked was, how did the building deteriorate to its present state of disrepair? The answer is, is that the owner of the property for many years lived in a distant state and he did not make the property available for acquisition until recently. As soon as it became known that this property might be able to be acquired, the Old Brunswick Circuit Foundation, the Methodist Heritage Preservation Organization in Southern Virginia, entered into negotiations with him which have resulted in the purchase of the property by the foundation in the spring of 2009. What are the plans for this property? Well, the first stage is to obtain the necessary funds needed to pay off the bridge loan, which had to be acquired in order to exercise the option to purchase within the time period permitted. Then the following phase that is anticipated is stabilization of the existing brick walls to hold in place what remains of this remarkable uh, structure. Structural engineers who have recently examined this property tell us that these walls appear to be solid and they can design a metal apparatus and framework that will hold them in place. Once these structures have been accomplished, then the plan is to clear the grounds of all of this underbrush and undergrowth and erect a protective barrier around the big walls and then develop an interpretive tour which would be self-guided and facilitate the story 
of Randolph-Macon's heritage here and also the heritage of the several African-American institutions that operated here beginning shortly after the college relocated to Ashland and in addition uh, lay out a nature and hiking trail on the more than 12 acres of land that came with the acquisition of the main building and the frame uh, structure adjacent to it, which is associated with the African-American institutions. Later phases could involve some selective reconstruction of the main building dependent on feasibility and cost. How can I participate in this effort to preserve this priceless uh, piece of Randolph-Macon and early American pioneer Methodist heritage uh, work. You can do so by contacting alumni and friends who you think may be interested in this si uh, subject but who don't know about the project and also by assisting with financial aid and endorsements of the work. If everyone would contact one this would be a great way to make this project the successful venture that it needs to be done. More information about this project can be obtained by contacting alumnus Jack Russell at area code 804-355-0100. Contributions can be directed to the Randolph-Macon Boydton Fund in care of the Old Brunswick Circuit Foundation, P.O. Box 385, Lawrenceville, Virginia. 23868 to the attention of Glenn Johnson, Treasurer.